Uh, good morning, all of you. Um, this session would be uh, mainly concentrating on the various web security vulnerabilities that might exist in applications interacting with the users over a network. So we'll start uh, right away. This is the agenda of the session. Unvalidated input, broken access control, broken authentication, cross-site scripting, buffer overflows, injection flaws, improper error handling, insecure storage, denial of service, insecure configuration. First, uh, first vulnerability that is caused generally to unvalidated input. All input is evil until proven otherwise. This is in fact a very important rule in the uh, field of security because an attacker has only one tool in his hand through which he can attack systems. And that one tool is input. It is only through input that attackers succeed in sending malicious content to a server or a service running on a particular system. So any input that an application accepts from a particular user, it must scrutinize it mercilessly for the presence of any malicious content. And if any malicious content is found, it should either be rejected, displaying a suitable error message, or it should be filtered into a safer form. These are the various types of input. Just a few have uh, enumerated here, like HTTP requests, commands, network packets, tampering attacks, like forced browsing, command insertion, also known as code injection, cross-site scripting, buffer overflows, SQL injection. This is a kind of command insertion, hidden film, hidden film manipulation. We'll start with a real case that existed a long while ago in Microsoft IIS or PWS. These are two web servers uh, by Microsoft. As you know, any web server has got something called WebRoot. And uh, this WebRoot is the folder from which uh, pages are served to a user. In a secure web server, a user is not supposed to access anything outside the web root. But there was a vulnerability in uh, Microsoft IIS which allowed this to implement the security feature. The security feature that a user is not able to access anything outside the web root, they used an algorithm somewhat like this. Whenever a user is requesting an URL, it would map the URL to a path of the resource in the hard disk of the server. And then it will validate the path of the resource. If the path of the resource starts with C, INET per WW root, which is assumed to be web root in this case, and it is also the default web root in Microsoft IIS, then access would be allowed. If it doesn't start with this, it means the uh, requested resource is not lying within the web root. Hence, access would be denied. And this algorithm is not as efficient as, as it seems to be. Let us see what attackers did to get around this feature and access resources outside the web root. They would use an user URL somewhat like this, like HTTP, the target server, two double dots, two double dots, and Windows system header to cmd.exe. Here they are actually trying to access system32 folder, which is outside the web root. Now, why IIS allowed access to this particular folder, that is system32? Because as per the algorithm, it will map this URL into the resource on the hard disk. And so it is mapping it to C, INET, per WW root, two double dot, two double dot, and the rest. Now this two double dot means two folders up, which brings you to C drive. And then it goes into Windows, system32, cmd.exe. Now, since the algorithm is checking whether the path begins with C init per, init per WW root, hence it passes the test because it does begin with C init per WW root. And it allows access to the system32 folder to the attackers. Now, what IIS forgot to check is this thing that I just explained, like init per, init per WW root and two double dots is actually taking you to C drive. So what IIS should have done is reduce this long path into this unique form of path that is also known as canonical form. A canonical form is a unique representation of various other forms of the same thing. So IIS is forgetting to, forgetting to canonicalize the path into this form. Had it done that, it could have easily found that the path doesn't begin with INET perb WW root. Of course, this was patched later on once the uh, this vulnerability was disclosed. And <clears throat> they made a safer algorithm which uh, introduced that step for canonical, canonicalization. 
after mapping the URL to the path of the resource, canonicalize it and then validate it. And yes, you can find this uh, vulnerability in bug track. That is the link. If you want, you can note it down. Securityfocus.com BID 1806. That's the ID of the uh, vulnerability. I'm moving ahead. So how to prevent these vulnerabilities? Canonicalize. Input should be converted to the simplest form before they are validated, as we saw in the previous slide. Uh, this second point is regarding web uh, applications where there are input forms. This we have learned in the training. There should be uh, server-side validation. It is a must because client-side validation alone uh, gives you no uh, security protection because it can be easily bypassed by disabling execution of script in your browser or even an attacker can frame his own uh, HTTP requests and send it, to, uh, send it to the target through Telnet or Netcat. Uh, detailed code review, of course, for tainted parameters. Uh, tainted parameters are those parameters which have not been validated. So those are called, called tainted parameters. Even uh, Perl, I think, uh, yeah, Perl, Perl offers you an um, option to find out all taint, uh, tainted parameters, and that option is probably minus T. Uh, we are moving into the next uh, type of vulnerability. This is broken access control. Access control, as you might know, uh, is also sometimes called authorization. It is a feature uh, with which access control is how a web application grants access to content and functions to some users and not others. Like if there is someone in administrator's group, he gets uh, the whole access to the system. If someone is in uh, user group, he might, he might not get all the access to the system. Uh, features of access control, it is closely associated with the content and functions of the application. This is true because access control of an e-banking application would be very different from access control of, let's say, uh, an airline reservation system. Users are generally managed by putting them under various groups or roles with various privileges. Some common mistakes that can occur while uh, designing an uh, access control system. Administrative interfaces that allow site administrators to manage a site over the internet. Uh, this should never be done because if you're allowing an administrator to do the administration work of a site over the internet, it means you're providing an interface which is open to the internet. And if it is open in the internet, it is open to the attackers as well. So attackers would definitely spend sleepless nights to find out one security flaw in that interface and then take over the system. Insertion of access control rules in various locations all over the code on an ad hoc basis. Um, this generally happens when the access control policy is not uh, planned properly before the coding phase begins. Because uh, if it is not planned properly, the programmer starts inserting access control rules wherever they feel necessary. And it is very much possible that uh, he might miss out some important access control check at some um, module, which can be discovered by an attacker and then be exploited by him. Common attacks uh, are forced browsing past access control checks. We'll discuss this first point. Uh, forced browsing, um, you might have seen li uh, applications like Yahoo or ICICBank.com. There, you have to log in with your username and password to access the internal pages. Unless you log in, you, cannot, you should not be able to access the internal pages that belongs to you. Now, in many university sites, it has been found <coughs> that uh, the designer often forgets to put an access control check in some uh, pages inside the application. So what the students do, they keep hitting, they keep trying all possible URLs that lead to internal pages, and they might succeed in getting some pages uh, which, uh, in which uh, access control check is missing. So this is called forced browsing. So we have to be very careful that each and every page has got access control check in the beginning before it is being allowed to the uh, user. Exploiting browser cache. Let us say you're logged in into an email system and you log out, but you don't close the browser. If an attacker has an access to the system, he can simply come and hit the back button and see your confidential mails. So for any page, any web page, which has got confidential information, we should disable browser cache.
yeah how to disable browser cache these are some html codes the pragma tag is basically for http 1.0 the older version the rest are for the newer version um, however html tags are not very reliable because uh, many browsers tend to ignore them uh, a better way would be to send the um, access control disabling uh, directives through http through the headers of http response and that can be done through server side scripting languages like asp and uh, we have code equivalents for the same thing in jsp and php so you can see both all the codes are doing basically the same job they are disabling they are trying every possible way to disable the browser cache broken authentication we'll start with what is authentication that is uh, authentication is just proving that you are the person who should be accessing the system and it, it is generally done through user id and password we all know software and hardware based cryptographic tokens that can have uh, that can include smart cards biometrics like the system checks your fingerprints or retina session management uh, once authentication is done a session has to be managed because it is only through a session that a system keeps track of the user who has logged in and it saves him from the trouble of logging in again and again for every for each and every module or page session management uh, web applications must establish sessions to keep track of the stream of requests from each user i just explained this http doesn't provide this capability http protocol does not have this capability so web applications must create it for themselves and there are various way, uh, ways a web designer or a programmer would create uh, would create would uh, put the functionality of uh, uh, sessions one common way is uh, creating session tokens uh, or session ids which are generally stored in cookies or are exchanged between the client and the server uh, in hidden input forms some common attacks walk by attacks this is very simple like you log into your e bank e banking account and then you go for a coffee for 5 minutes without locking the system someone comes uh, accesses your accesses your account and transfers all your money to his account this is walk by attacks uh, this is web walk by attack session hijacking this is a little more complicated in session hijacking an attacker would always try to determine the session id or the session token that we discussed in the previous slide Uh, he'll try to determine what session id is being used by a particular user when he is interacting with the server there are various ways uh, of uh, finding out session ids that we'll be discussing in the remaining session so once the attacker gets the session id he'll send the same request uh, see he'll send the request to the server same server using the same session id that someone else is using therefore he gains access to his session from his terminal this is called session hijacking <laughs> prevention uh, reauthentication for critical functionalities uh, this can um, make the walk by attacks a little less uh, critical like uh, you might have seen this if you have uh, uh, ever tried to change password in yahoo like uh, even if you leave the desktop for uh, around 5 minutes and attacker comes he can delete your mails from yahoo he can read all your mails from yahoo but he cannot change the password because if he tries to change the password the system will ask him to reauthenticate himself and he cannot because he doesn't know your password so reauthentication should be enforced for all, all critical functionalities use of ssl to protect authentication credentials uh, like we discussed in session hijacking an attacker would try to determine what session id someone else is using and this can be uh, found out by sniffing of the network but if the session ids are being protected by ssl or in a, or in other words if they are encrypted the task would become very very difficult for the attacker to decrypt it and then find out the session id of course code review and penetration uh, penetration testing can be done avoid implicit trust between components whenever one component uh, is interacting with another component in a critical system the component should authenticate himself uh, itself to the another component the reason for uh, uh, including this is uh, it will prevent an attacker from putting his own putting in his own component in between and making it possible to interact with the um, other components of the system 
and thereby gaining an unauthorized access to the system. Let's come to cross-site scripting. This is uh, not very complicated, but this is one of the most notorious form of attacks that can be done in internet. Cross-site scripting occurs when an attacker uses a web application to send malicious code, generally in the form of a client-side script, actually, to a different, to a different end user. This generally happens uh, when an application is taking input in the form of uh, um, HTML forms and the same input goes back as output in some other web page. So uh, a typical example would be guestbook applications. Like in guestbook applications, a guest who is signing the guestbook puts his comment in a form and this appears back in the guestbook page. So whenever another person is accessing the guestbook page, he finds the same input back. Now, if an attacker is signing the guest book, he can inject his own client-side script code like JavaScript. And if this thing finds its way into the output web page, anybody who visits the web page, the output web page, that is the guest book web page, his browser is going to run that particular JavaScript code. So this is called cross-site scripting attack. And because uh, JavaScript code is, because with this kind of attack, an attacker is making it possible for a JavaScript code to be executed in someone else's browser. It can lead to annoyance to the end user. We'll see an example of this. Redirecting the user to some other page or site. This can be done by uh, the JavaScript. It would simply change the location.hrf value and he'll, he'll be redirected to some other site. Disclosure of the user's, uh, user's session cookie. Of course, because uh, JavaScript can read uh, cookie values. Cookie poisoning. The JavaScript code can change the cookie values. Session hijacking. If the attacker succeeds in reading some critical uh, session IDs from the cookie, he can hijack the session. This is a vulnerability in uh, community architect guest, uh, guest book. Uh, this is the normal operation of the guest book. A person would enter his name, email, address, phone number, and comments. Now, I, I explained to you that this thing will become a part of the guestbook web page. Let's look at that, where, this, uh, where these inputs are going. These are the HTML codes. You can see the name has gone there, the email ID, and his comment has come here, his address and phone number. And this is the output. <coughs> Whenever someone visits the guestbook web page, he'll find this. Now, let's see what an attacker can do to exploit this guestbook. He doesn't enter any good looking comment this time, he inputs a JavaScript code. Now, this particular guestbook is not validating the input to, uh, for the presence of any JavaScript code. Actually, in an ideal situation, all JavaScript code should have been removed. But this one is not doing that. Hence, the JavaScript code finds its way into the HTML code. And now when this page loads uh, in the browser, this code will be executed. And this code is basically opening some, random, some, some images in random locations in the form of pop-ups. So the output is, you see the whole screen is cluttered with those pop-ups. Uh, and this advisory has been uh, uh, and this advisory has been documented in this particular um, link. You can note it down if you want to have a look at it afterwards. I'm moving ahead. So we saw that we have to filter out all script codes. Similarly, there are other tags like object tag, embed tag, applet tag. These also need to be filtered out because all these tags uh, allow you to allow an attacker to input um, some sort of executable code that will be executed in a, executed in a browser. Okay, why form form tag? Form tag doesn't allow you to enter any executable code. Still, then why form tag? It's because if an attacker succeeds in Inputting a form tag, he can create a small login and password form. 
and that can be used for phishing attacks. He can fool the user to enter his username and password. And that form might be submitting the username and password to the attacker's uh, script. That's why we should uh, filter out all form tags as well. Buffer overflows. This is also one of the most notorious form of attacks. Attackers use buffer overflows to corrupt the execution stack of an application. Buffer overflows are easy to avoid, difficult to discover, and extremely difficult to exploit. Easy to avoid because if you follow some golden rules of uh, memory management, uh, there would be no buffer overflows in your application. Difficult to discover and extremely difficult to exploit because buffer overflows are highly complex and you have to, the attacker must understand the internals of a processor, memory management, and a lot of other things to actually exploit buffer overflows to, uh, uh, to create a full-fledged attack. Types of attacks, attackers send carefully crafted input to a web application. An attacker ca can cause the application to execute arbitrary code. When difficult to attack, the attackers can crash the application, thereby, create, thereby leading to DOS, denial of service. We'll be looking into denial of service in the later part of this session. Now let's, uh, let, let me explain you buffer overflow with a very simple example. This is not a real life situation, but this is good enough to explain what it is. There, this is a small C program. There's a main and it's calling a function and it's passing the string high into the function. And let's see what the function is doing. The function is creating a, a buffer of four bytes and it is copying that string into the buffer. Now, just when the function is called, when the main is calling the function, this is what the stack look, uh, looks like. Because the main has to pass the string, string to the function, it is, uh, in C it is actually done through by passing the um, address of the string to the call function. So it is allocating four bytes on the top and it is passing that address of high in the first four bytes. Now since the function is called, this, uh, the main function has to save, I mean the processor, the processor does it, the processor saves the written address of the main on the stack, then the base pointer of the main is saved on the stack. And then the function is called. I hope you know why the instruction pointer is saved because once the function completes execution, the control has, has to return to the main. And it, at that point of time, it will leave that save address, saved address, which is the address of the main. So once function completes, it will check what address is saved, and it will return to that address, so it will return to the main. Now the function starts executing. The function will allocate four bytes of buffer. That cab buffer four has been allocated here. Now the job of function is to copy the string high into this buffer. Let's see that. Done. So everything seems good so far. But what happens if that string to be copied is too long? Like uh, let's say good morning. The four bytes of buffer is here and the string good morning is copied. You see it is overwriting, it is, it is overflowing the allocated buffer and it is overwriting the base pointer and the instruction pointer where the address of main was supposed to be there. And therefore, the written address now changes to something like 676C, 696C. You can find this out from the hex codes of G9, I, N which have replaced the written address. So now after the function completes execution, the control doesn't return to main because the address is simply not there in the written address. Instead, it returns to this address, 676C, 696C. And this address may not be, this memory location may not be within the process region of the current process, and it might lead to a segmentation fault thereby crashing the application. In real life scenarios, this input would, this input would be coming from a user. And if there is a skilled attacker, he could overflow this stack, this allocated buffer, in such a manner that uh, the area just above the uh, written address, that is the top pin portion, would be overwritten with an executable code, and uh, most probably a malicious executable code. And the written address would be overwritten by the address of the executable code. Now what happens, when the function completes execution, the control would return to the address indicated by the written address, which is pointing to the address of the executable code. Therefore, that executable code would be executed, and the attacker, if the attacker has put any malicious uh, intent in that code, 
That would be executed as well. How to protect a buffer overflow? Sorry, uh, this is uh, some major attacks that have taken place, uh, like code red virus. It uh, attacked a buffer overflow weakness in Microsoft IIS. Microsoft lost $2.6 billion due to this attack. Sasa worm, you might remember in 2004, it was restarting your systems again and again with a warning of about 30 seconds or so. It attacked uh, LSAS, it's a service in Microsoft uh, Windows, uh, LSAS buffer overflow, and Microsoft lost $3.5 billion due to this attack. Buffer overflows, uh, how to prevent it? C programmers now refrain from using strcpy, strcat, you, you know this uh, because strcpy and strcat uh, um, do not allow you to limit the number of characters to be taken, to be accepted. So an attacker can, so if the input is coming from a user, he can easily overflow the allocated uh, area, the allocated uh, cat array or buffer. Uh, instead they use strncpy, strncat because here there is a third argument which is, an, which is an integer which takes a number which indicates what is the maximum number of characters to be copied. Never use getters. In fact, if you even try to use getters and compile it on a GC, GCC, it will throw in a warning that uh, GC, uh, getters function is uh, very dangerous. The, the reason is same because there is no way to limit the number of characters that the getters is accepting. Programmers now write the applications in languages like Java, Visual Basic, this is, a very, uh, this is only for um, IT industries because there we don't have time to uh, actually point out all flaws or all possible uh, points where buffer overflows can occur. So they choose languages like Visual Basic or Java, which has better stack and memory management features. Here you do not have to worry about uh, limiting the number of characters to be input. The language takes care of it. Send Microsystems is trying to make uh, the Spark processor immune to stack overflow attack by introducing a new feature to protect the written address during a subroutine call. Because you see, stack overflow attack or this buffer overflow attack uh, depends completely on the modification of the written value to point it to some malicious executable code. So they are trying to plug this loophole at the root itself by protecting that written address in the stack. Injection flaws. Actually, we have seen already two examples of injection flaws. Cross-site scripting itself is an injection flaw. And even in buffer overflow, we are injecting malicious code. Injection flaw lets you inject executable code at places where it is not allowed in a secure system, which might lead to execution of the code and compromise of the system. Common attacks relay malicious content through a web application to another system. This we have seen in cross-site scripting because you are putting a JavaScript code which is relayed to another user. Calls to operating system via system calls can be done through buffer overflows. Use of external programs via shell commands. Calls to backend databases via SQL. This is the popular case of SQL injection. We'll be looking into this. Complete script injection. Again, this uh, we saw in uh, cross-site scripting. Okay, now let's uh, look at SQL injection in detail. SQL injection is particularly widespread and dangerous form of injection. SQL injection is possible if the value of any parameter is used in SQL queries. Okay, like in a login form, the input is taken from the user and that input uh, is used in a backend SQL query. In such cases, SQL injection attack is possible if a proper validation is not done. The attacker can retrieve, modify, corrupt or destroy database co contents. Okay, blockage is a application um, which has a login form. Uh, so let's see how an attacker can, uh, can exploit an SQL injection vulnerability in this application. He enters the username as black hat hacker and a single quote. That single quote is to create a syntax error in the backend SQL query. This is also called a single quote trick in SQL injection. So when he uh, tries that uh, single quote trick, he gets an error, like syntax error in string query account underscore name equal to whatever. So from this syntax error, we also see a portion of the uh, of the query, the backend SQL query. From this, we get a fair idea of what the query is like and how the system is operating. 
a query is something like select some column, we don't know what, from some table where account name equal to the user that we're passing and password equal to the password we're entering. So and now we can also understand why uh, there is a syntax error because this extra code, there is no matching for this uh, pair for this code. You can see the number of quotes is an odd number. That's why it is causing uh, the syntax error. Okay, now from this we also get an idea how the system is operating. Um, if the account name and the passwords match with any entry in the database, this query would return at, le at least one row. In, it, should be, it would be precisely one row, actually. So if this query is returning a row, then the system allows access to the user. If it is not returning a row, that means there is no username and password matching with the database, then the system won't allow access to the system, uh, to the user. Now that we have got an idea of the query, now let's see what an attacker would do to gain access to the system even though he doesn't know the username and password. He would enter this as the password. A single quote or A equal to A. Now what happens, this thing will become a part of the query. So this thing will go straight into that. And this is happening because the system is not validating the password. Now when it goes into that, the query becomes like this. Select some column from some table and the where clause is account name equal to account name equal to black hat hacker, that doesn't matter, and see the password. Password equal to, this single quote is closing the condition, password equal to A. And this is starting a new OR condition. And this OR condition is always true. So this full query will always return all the rows of the database. Hence, the system finds that rows are being returned, and it, and it assumes that the password is matching, and hence it allows access to the system. This is what happens. He entered those uh, account name and password and he gets the, gets the page, the login, the internal page. How to avoid injection flaws? Structure requests in a manner that ensures that all supplied parameters are treated as data rather than potentially executable content like in the previous example, we saw that password, the single quote closed the password and started a new query, which is a, started a new condition, which is executable. So we have to ensure that anything that is being input will be treated as data only, and it cannot escape the data portion become a part of the query. Uh, like in the previous example, it could have been easily avoided. It could have been easily avoided if we would have converted the single quote into two quotes, because in Oracle, two simultaneous quotes in a string means one single quote. Convert special characters to the correct form, like we discussed just now, that single quote has been converted to something that represents a quote in the data. Run the application with minimum privileges required. This is not just specific to injection flaw, this policy should be applied everywhere. Always run the application or the service with minimum privileges required. This is because even if the attacker Succeeds in, succeeds in compromising the uh, service, then he won't be uh, uh, he won't be able to mess around with the system completely because that particular application was running with very low privileges, which is just enough to run that service. <coughs> improper error handling. In fact, we saw an example of improper error handling in the previous slide. When it caused the syntax error, it showed a portion of the SQL query which gave enough clue to the attacker how to exploit the SQL injection vulnerability. So any error that occurs in a system has to be handled properly and should not throw away any crucial information about the backend service. Common problems, uh, inconsistencies in error messages which can reveal important clues on how the system works. Stack traces, database terms and error codes are displayed on error. If you're programming yourself, it is fine, but when you are programming a thing that would be available to end user, you should not uh, show any stack traces, database terms, and error codes on an error. Syntax errors are displayed along with portions of the codes. This we saw in the last example. Okay. An attacker is trying to uh, log in with an account name and a password, and this is the error message. Sorry, password is incorrect. Uh, this is not an ideal situation because 
If such an error message appears, the attacker understands that the account name is correct, only the password is incorrect. So he would simply brute force the system with all possible passwords. This is an ideal error message, either account name or password is incorrect. Now the task of the attacker is very tough. He has to brute force both the username and the password and the correct combination as well. This vulnerability was present in a Government of India tourism website, incredibleindia.org. This is a valid page, the first link. You can see there's a parameter being passed, page ID equal to 828. But when we try this single quote trick, the single quote trick that we learnt in SQL injection um, portion, we get an error message. Unclosed quotation mark before the character string. And we get the names of two tables, MNC page, MNC category, and one column. So from this error message, the attacker can draw a conclusion that there is there are two tables, MNC page and MNC category. Both of them have a column called MNC category ID. Actually, uh, this. Uh, this was a very uh, lengthy attack. There are other trials like this was the first trial and after doing a few more trials, after getting a few more error messages, we could have uh, gained enough information to drop some tables of the uh, database of incrediblenindia.org and it has actually happened twice. Some attacker dropped the table twice in this uh, incrediblenindia.org site. Insecure storage. Most applications need to store sensitive information either in a database or on a file system. Types of sensitive information can be passwords, credit card numbers, account records, proprietary inf information. Some common mistakes that can occur. Failure to encrypt critical data. All critical data must be encrypted and then stored. Insecure storage of keys and passwords, improper storage of secrets and memory, poor sources of randomness. Okay, why randomness is required? Uh, randomness is required to select, uh, to assign session IDs or session tokens to a user who has been authenticated. Now, if the session IDs are not being absolutely random and if it is predictable, then an attacker sitting on his own system can predict what session ID is being used by someone else. And if it is predictable, he can use the session ID to hijack the session. Poor choice of algorithm. Actually, this is regarding encryption algorithm. Like, never attempt to invent a new encryption algorithm. There are, uh, there are already very good encryption algorithms which are uh, known to be with zero vulnerabilities uh, today. So, better use those algorithms instead of inventing your own encryption algorithm. Because if you invent your own encryption algorithm, attackers can find uh, a flaw in it in a, within a few days. Uh, an encryption algorithm to be believed to be secure takes a long period of time. Types of attacks that can be launched, examining tokens, session IDs, cookies, etc. to see if they are obviously not random. That is, they will try to see if the um, uh, assignment of session IDs are predictable in any manner. Finding cryptographic flaws. How to prevent insecure storage. Instead of storing encrypted passwords, use a one-way function such as SHA1 or MD5 to hash the passwords. When you hash a password, you get the hash from the password, but you cannot get the password back from the hash. That's the feature of hashing. If cryptography must be done, choose a library that has been exposed to public scrutiny and makes sure that there are no open vulnerabilities. Like RSA encryption, that is used for public key infrastructure. That has been exposed to public scrutiny, and we know that it is it is a time-tested uh, encryption. So we can follow those reliable encryption, um, the, those reliable cryptographic cryptographic algorithms instead of using your own. The third point is very important. Like uh, when you are processing passwords or uh, some critical uh, or sensitive data, you should clear the data of the memory as soon as possible. Like if you compare the password with the original password, clear it immediately. Why? Because if that system, which is doing all this job of comparison and all, is being shared by another user, like in a Unix system, a Unix system is shared by many users, and if these um, things are not cleared, the other user can probe into the RAM to find out what sensitive information is being stored or being processed. 
you might argue that sometimes it is not possible because uh, the uh, processor uh, has features which protect another user from probing into the address space of another user. But uh, attackers have uh, methods like they can um, make a they can create a segmentation fault, or they can generate a code dump that would dump the segment, uh, uh, the dump the memory which is not within his uh, address space. So in this way, he can find out what um, sensitive information is being processed. Denial of service attack. Denial of service attack or DOS attack is an attempt to make a computer service unavailable to its intended users. Some common attacks like consuming bandwidth, database connections, disk storage, CPU, memory, threads, application specific resources. This can be easily done by creating a huge number of requests to a particular server. So the server becomes busy and it is unable to serve the other uh, innocent users. Locking out a legitimate user by sending invalid credentials. This can be done in Infosys itself. Suppose you want your uh, friend not to log into his system. What would you do? You would just enter his username uh, thrice with wrong password and it is locked out. That's also a form of DOS attack. Exploiting buffer overflows and injection flaws to inject code or commands to shut down or, insta or stall important service. Yes, with injection flaws or buffer overflows, we have seen that we can execute any malicious code in the server. So in this malicious code, we can give codes to shut down the server or say install or stall some particular service going on. So once it is stalled, others cannot access it. This was a denial of service attack present in overkill. This was uh, basically due to an integer underflow error. The vulnerability was an integer underflow error in a Linux space gaming daemon called overkill. It could be exploited to launch denial of service attacks by sending UDP packets of size less than 12 bytes. And this was a very strange case, like the application, the daemon was not uh, handling this peculiar situation in which an attacker might send an UDP packet less than 12 bytes. It was happily assuming that any packet that would come is greater than 12 bytes and it was processing it in that way. So since this particular uh, case was not handled properly, the system, the, the overkill thing crashed. So anytime an overkill daemon is running, any attacker would send, would frame in, uh, frame in a UDP packet which of size less than 12 bytes and send it to the uh, overkill service and since it is not handling it, it would crash and nobody else would be able to use or play on this uh, service. How to prevent load balancing? Um, this is for the case in which we saw that we can send a huge number of requests to a server to exhaust the resources. So if we are using load balancing, that load will be distributed among many servers and it will make the attack less difficult, um, I mean more difficult. Analyze each resource and check if there is a way to exhaust it. Limit resources to any user to bare minimum. This would be very handy to prevent uh, denial of service attacks. Let us say there's a unique system and you're not limiting the number of uh, the uh, megabytes or the uh, disk space to be assigned to each user. He can simply create files or he can simply create a program that would uh, keep adding files and you, would, you could com consume the whole hard disk. So we should limit resource for every user. Check error handling scheme and ensure that an error cannot affect the overall operating of the operation of the system. Like in overkill case, there it is not handling a particular error and as a result the whole service is crashing. So we should check the error handling scheme thoroughly and we should ensure that one particular error cannot lead to a crash of the whole system or it cannot shut down any important service of the system. Insecure configuration. Insecure configuration of a system can itself be a potential vulnerability. Unpatched security flaws in a software like every day uh, Microsoft uh, is bringing out patches and we keep complaining why our system restarts. But that is necessary because if it is not patched, an attacker can exploit a security flaw in the unpatched system and gain access to your system. Server software flaws or misconfigurations that permit directory listing or directory traversal attacks. Improper file and directory permissions. Of course, you have, if you have not set the file and folder permissions properly, you might have given a crucial permission to some attacker. 
default accounts with default passwords. Like when you install Oracle for the first time, the, some, there are some default users and passwords, like system has the password manager. The sys user, ha, sys user has a password change on install. Now, right after installing, you should immediately change these passwords. Otherwise, anybody who knows you installing can gain access to your, to your Oracle RDBMS at that point of time itself. Improper authentication with external systems. This we have uh, gone through before. Whenever one system is interacting with another system, it should authenticate itself. And the other system should ensure that this system is auth authenticating itself before the interaction begins. How to prevent uh, insecure flaws due to insecure configuration? Configure all security mechanisms. Set up roles, permissions, and accounts carefully. Disable all default accounts or change their passwords. In fact, it is uh, more recommendable uh, to, dif to disable the default accounts because even if you keep those accounts, the default accounts, the task of the attacker, and even if you have changed the passwords, the task of the attacker is simply to brute force because he knows that, knows that a, a few default accounts are, are existing in the system. So uh, if you scan, if you scan with any vulnerability scanner, uh, you'll, al you'll always find that the scanner reports that in Oracle, two default accounts are enabled. It should be disabled. Or in IIS, two uh, uh, default accounts are enabled. That is the reason to disable all default accounts. Enable logging and alerts. This is because uh, even if an attack takes place, it is not too difficult to track who has attacked by examining the logs and alerts. Monitor the latest security vulnerabilities published. There are various security lists uh, over the internet like bug track, Secunia, FRSIRT, CVE. And, one, and this is basically the job of the administrator. He should uh, keep himself updated with all the security vulnerabilities coming each and every day so that he knows uh, what vulnerability might exist in his network. Apply the latest security patches, again a job of the administrator, as well as desktop users, like if uh, you are using some application and that has, uh, and a security vulnerability has been disclosed in that application, you should immediately patch it if it is available. Update the security configuration guidelines. Yeah, because uh, newer uh, types of attacks emerge every day, so you must uh, update your guidelines as well to keep, uh, to take care of those attacks. Scan for vulnerabilities with a vulnerability scanner regularly. There are lots of vulnerability scanners available, like uh, a, a hobbyist scanner is GFI Landguard. There's a Nessus, which is used by professionals. There's also an open source scanner like uh, Nikto. So you can use these uh, scanners to scan your system regularly. 